Hi, I'm Needless, and today I'd like us to think about what we know about the Second World War. What images pop into your head? Some of us might have images of Hitler and stormtroopers, Winston Churchill's voice calling out over loudspeakers, We will fight them on the beaches! Or maybe D-Day, the Allies storming Normandy. Images of brave young men taking on the fascist hordes that have taken over Europe. I want to step back for a second and ask why. Why are these the things we come away with? These events and images are reflective of what occurred, of course. But why are these the type of images that stick with us? The worldwide conflict lasted six years. Nine if we count Japan's invasion of China in 1936. It spanned six continents and saw 300 million soldiers serve, not counting the millions more that would serve at home. Why do Americans then have these images in their minds? Well, it wasn't by accident. They were consciously chosen. They aren't pulled from textbooks or primary sources, but from movie and TV screens. And with the advent of the mass popularity of video games, these specific moments have now been continually experienced. The question then must become, why are these the ones that were chosen? Why are these the certain stories highlighted endlessly and not others? What effects do these narratives about World War II have on us? Something's gone wrong in the happy-go-lucky world of Nintendo. Investigators found their first pipe bomb in the parking lot, and the Denver bomb squad immediately sealed off the building. Robotic cameras later found the entire school... First, let's start in the 90s. It's been 50 years since the conflict ended, and American culture now has begun to realize that those individuals that served on the home front and overseas were not in their prime anymore, that we would not have the utility of that direct connection to those people for much longer. Some of the stories and hear from some of the people that uh, were there 50 years ago, June 6, 1944. Soon it would become stories. With this realization, there was a major cultural movement to reframe and tell these stories of war in new ways. The generation that had served would be rechristened as the greatest generation, a term coined by a book of the same name by Tom Brucka. The men and women were now understood as those ancestors which had truly sacrificed for the generations to follow. Not only had they weathered the Great Depression, but they were chosen by their country to participate in a worldwide conflict. The play, from the villages and from the cities, bookkeepers, soda jerks, mechanics, college students, rich man, poor man, beggar man. Gone were the spaghetti western-esque narratives that immediately followed the war, or even the symbolic toss-ups found in blockbusters like Star Wars. Instead, there was a push to present the reverence of those that had served. These new depictions would strive to capture what this experience was like, with its most indelible example coming from Steven Spielberg's Saving Private Ryan. Now we can see where our image of D-Day comes from, what we've come to understand of what it meant to serve in World War II. The men as they approach the beach shake with fear. They vomit as the transports rock. On the beach, men die continually in the arms of their fellow soldiers. Boys cry out for their mothers. A man holds his dismembered arm in his hand. The picture is bleak, and as many critics and viewers have described, feels real. It's not simply about the greatest generation. It's about the cost, the sheer unbridled suffering. This new take was well received both commercially and critically, with critics writing, Spielberg is unrelenting in showing the horror of the event. We do look at it. We must watch it unflinchingly. The way we must watch the images of bodies pushed into mass graves at Dachau. And for the same reason, we must know the pity and terror of our times. What's unusual about this, in both the DD sequence and the closing struggle, is its terrifying repertorial candor. These scenes have a sensory fullness, the soundtrack is boomingly chaotic, yet astonishingly detailed. A realistic yet breakneck pace, a ceaseless movement in a vast visual scope. The film's bloody authenticity does not allow false majesty for the dead. More recently, YouTube channel History Buffs provided a similar reading of the film. I really do love this film and I consider it to be one of the greatest World War II movies ever made. And the reason for this is that it makes up for its inaccuracies with its authenticity. Steven Spielberg's objective was to provide us with a narrative of war itself rather than a detailed account on any one event or persons. To give us an idea of what horrors our grandfather's generation faced. To remind us of the personal sacrifices they made to secure our freedom. Our way of life that we enjoy today is all made possible because of what these brave men did. 
The praise bestowed on this film is not illegitimate, but it's important what lesson these critics and in general audiences got from the film. The same idea keeps coming up. This film is honest, authentic, and functioning in a profound way that provides the viewer with a historical experience. This is something to focus on. The critics are assuming that this feeling they have in relation to the film is history, plain and simple. That by watching this film, you're getting a viewpoint in what actually occurred. There's this notion that it's speaking truth to power, showcasing the true horrors of war, only the sacrifice. But when we peer behind the expertly orchestrated scenes, we see a very specific understanding of war. I don't mean to take away the value of the film in specific respects. It does represent an American culture that doesn't want to sugarcoat the conflict or the trauma experienced by these men. As the ending scene showcases, those who came home were not happy-go-lucky, as older portrayals showed. A man stands before the grave of a fallen soldier. He's surrounded by a sea of white crosses. His face is twisted in sorrow. He turns to his wife, tell me I'm a good man. While acknowledging this, the great sacrifice showcase is notably still understood as a necessary condition. They had to do it. As Howard Zinn, himself a veteran of the Second World War and a historian described, in Saving Private Ryan, there is never any doubt that the cause is just. This is the good war. There is no need to say the words explicitly, yes, getting rid of fascism was a good cause. Yet, does that unquestionably make it a good war? The war corrupted us, did it not? The hate it engendered was not confined to Nazis. We put Japanese families in concentration camps. When the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, our west coast became a potential combat zone. Living in that zone were more than 100,000 persons of Japanese ancestry, two-thirds of them American citizens, one-third aliens. We knew that some among them were potentially dangerous. Most were loyal. But no one knew what would happen among this concentrated population if Japanese forces should try to invade our shores. Military authorities therefore determined that all of them, citizens and aliens alike, would have to move. This picture tells how the mass migration was accomplished. Neither the Army nor the War Relocation Authority relished the idea of taking men, women, and children from their homes, their shops, and their farms. So the military and civilian agencies alike determined to do the job as a democracy should, with real consideration for the people involved. Returning back to Zinn's quote, we killed huge numbers of innocent people. The word atrocity fits. In our bombing of Dresden, Hamburg, Tokyo, and finally Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Also when the war ended, we and our allies began preparing for another, this time with nuclear weapons, which if we used them would make Hitler's Holocaust look puny. We can argue endlessly over whether there was an alternative in the short run, whether fascism could have been resisted without 50 million dead. Yet the long-term effect of World War II on the thinking of the world was pernicious and deep. It made war so thoroughly discredited by the senseless slaughter of World War I noble once again. It enabled political leaders, whatever miserable adventure they would take us into, whatever mayhem they would wreck on other people. Two million dead in Korea, at least that many in Southeast Asia, hundreds of thousands in Iraq, and on our own to invoke World War II as a model. As Zinn described, the film never interrogates the war. It is a foregone conclusion and that if a war is just, then it must be fought. Though importantly, this comparison to the Second World War, this narrative around the conflict, as he described, allows the space for war to be good. In thinking about how politicians have utilized the Second World War, Zinn's point would be incredibly apparent. States like these and their terrorist allies constitute an axis of evil, arming to threaten the peace of the world by seeking weapons of mass destruction. These regimes pose a grave and growing danger, yet time is not on our side. I will not wait on events while dangers gather. I will not stand by as peril draws closer and closer. The United States of America will not permit the world's most dangerous regimes to threaten us with the world's most destructive weapons. This greatest generation framing exemplifies empathy, but an empathy that never genuinely questions those that sent the men to war. Authenticity then, in portraying the horrors of war within the cinematic flourishes displayed on screen, aid in this overlying post-war narrative of the Second World War as a purely historical one, which in turn adds credence to an American culture and politics that uses these same images we have in our heads about the Second World War, provided by films like Saving Private Ryan, 
to justify American foreign policy today. As can be seen in this commercial from the American military in 2020, the message is effectively the same. When freedom is threatened around the world, when floodwaters rise, and wildfires rage, wherever the fight, whoever the enemy, when America needs her best, she sends a soldier. Do you have what it takes? Find out at GoArmy.com slash war. We are simply fighting the good fight, protecting ourselves and freedom. To look at another development in the 90s, video games were in a much different place than movies were. At the time, games were understood as still something akin to a children's toy, and were most definitely not understood as high art, or even art for that matter, by the greater public. Paradoxically, games were assumed to provide players, especially children, which the general public still associated games with, as having a guttural grasp on their imaginations. But at the same time, video games were still only understood as playthings. Not like movies which could provide meaningful violence, like Saving Private Ryan. In 1993, the Congressional Hearings on Video Game Violence, it showcased this opinion. Last Wednesday, in fact, as we were announcing our intention to introduce uh, legislation to create a rating system for video games and to hold this hearing, one video game maker was announcing the release of yet another brutal video game which is called Lethal Enforcers. This game encourages players to shoot uh, this gun, which is called a just... In this backdrop for this fight for legitimacy, Steven Spielberg, while finishing up his film, that would be the seminal film of the greatest generation trope, would turn to the relatively new developer, DreamWorks Interactive, to create a companion piece of sorts to Saving Private Ryan, with the hopes that it could reach audiences like his then adolescent son. The project was to be named after the highest award in the American military, Medal of Honor. <laughs> Interactive present Medal of Honor. Prepare for your finest hour. Players then are asked effectively to participate in history. It is not someone else's finest hour, but yours. Players were to learn through analogous experience. They would become an American soldier, not simply watch one on screen. This importantly also meant for Medal of Honor that the same level of historical detail shared with this same idea of authenticity was basically Saving Private Ryan made interactive. Quick overview of the experience. Medal of Honor, while functioning as a companion of sorts to Saving Private Ryan, did not follow the same characters like other movie tie-in games. Instead, the general narrative of the experience saw players taking on the role of a highly capable soldier working through covert missions that will assist in the Allied war effort. It's important to dissect the experience of playing Medal of Honor and understand how it had taken the trappings of this greatest generation trope while also being subject to its peers. Even though the game has been hailed for its historical detail in retrospect and at the time, returning to the game 22 years later reveals how quaint it was. Given its behind enemy lines framing, the game is small in scope, the environments are very linear and at times claustrophobic. Given the early 3D modeled characters and world, much of the story and narrative is provided by a beginning introduction cutscene and small sections of text outlining what is to happen in each level. One thing that honestly surprised me is how effective the sound design was. Because of how isolated some of the levels are, and the sometimes hard to orient movement controls, there's a real sense of fear as you hear the footsteps of someone moving towards you, which added to this trapped feeling while you were behind enemy lines kind of thing, which I genuinely did not think an F FPS experience from that time would deliver. And thinking about it in context, we can get a better understanding of the game. It was originally released for the PlayStation 1, a platform that was lagging behind when it came to the new up-and-coming first-person shooter craze started in the PC space with games like Doom and Wolfenstein. The game in many ways then functioned as a rebuttal against the then most influential FPS on consoles, GoldenEye. Comparing the two, the similarities are quite striking. The reviews of the time reflected this kinship between the games, continually referring to Medal of Honor in relation to GoldenEye, as if they were inextricably tied. The same aiming reticle system was used as players carefully moved the cursor over the enemy to carry out a shot. The AI in both functioned quite similarly, with an attention to detail to how enemies react to gunfire. The enemy falls to their knees after being shot in the torso, while immediately falling down dead if they're shot in the back. Notably, the game, unlike the gritty realization of war's horrors found in Saving Private Ryan, it's almost bloodless. The figures may feel in some sense realistic, but the conflict is more akin to paintball, with enemies falling without a scratch. And the same applies to the framing of the game. The player is a one-man army, in a similar form to Wolfenstein 3D's protagonist, BJ Blazkowicz, which would originally popularize the genre for audiences. Notably then, the game was not trying to reinvent the wheel, but instead give it a new paint job. 
and this paint job notably was tied to its deep connection to Saving Private Ryan. When the game was released in 1999, it was a major commercial smash. With this commercial praise also came the same reverence for its authenticity, which paralleled the response that Saving Private Ryan received. No one who didn't serve could possibly know how real this game is. Many of us would never want to find out, but taken as a fast shooter with smarts and style, Medal of Honor should certainly be a training mission for those who think that freedom doesn't come with a price tag. This game honors those who paid that price. This is interesting. There's the same understanding of authenticity, that we're getting something really true about what it means to fight as a soldier, and in this war. Though, ultimately the design language of these games is Goldeneye Wolfenstein 3D. The only difference is, Medal of Honor, with all of its visual trappings of this greatest generation mythos, would become the household name. Later household names like Call of Duty even, codename their first game, quote unquote, Medal of Honor Killer. With this seminal space then as a hallmark in the industry, this type of narrative expected and routinized in the industry was one of authenticity, military service, and the good war mythos. As can be seen in the recent Call of Duty World War II, even with almost a decade of time between the last Call of Duty World War II portrayal, the game effectively realizes the same greatest generation trope of Medal of Honor, and more specifically, Saving Private Ryan to a T. Showing them side by side, they're almost indistinguishable. Uh, Steven, you might want to call a, call a, a lawyer. Lawyer up a little bit, Steve, they're still- Returning to Medal of Honor, I want to dive deep into its development to see how this narrative came to develop and reify the greatest generation trope. Steven Spielberg wasn't the only direct connection to the set of Saving Private Ryan that the Medal of Honor team had they would also employ the assistance of Captain Dale Dye. He was the military advisor on Saving Private Ryan. Dai, a retired U.S. Marine officer and founder of Warriors Inc., a consulting company that specializes in providing movie productions with his personal military experience and stamp of approval, he had worked on projects like the aforementioned Saving Private Ryan, as well as Platoon, Forrest Gump, Band of Brothers, The Pacific, the list goes on. Dai would play a major role, being effectively at the heart of how this authentic type of military presentation was created and understood. On that BAR, stand by! I'm a retired captain. Fire! I uh, fought in uh, Southeast Asia and in the Middle East. I felt that uh, much of the movies that were being done about the military, about the American fighting man, were nonsense. So I came to Hollywood full of bright and shining promises and ideas about how I could fix all of this. I believe that there's a certain heart and a certain spirit that's common throughout fighting. And I think that actors who are like dry sponges so you pour on the water and the liquid and that sort of thing, need to be immersed in the rigorous lifestyle, in the horrors that infantrymen and combat people all over the world face. And so to the extent that insurance and lifestyles will allow, I immerse those actors in that lifestyle. Captain Dye said to us in boot camp, I want you to bring honor to that fraternity of men that died for your freedom. And uh, to me, I think that that is something that I'll always carry in the file throughout this film. When Dye first arrived at DreamWorks Interactive, he was less than satisfied with what they were trying to do. As Peter Hirschman, writer and producer on Medal of Honor, described, Dye thought of the project, uh, it was an, an exploitative, tone-deaf, irresponsible thing. Though as the dust settled and the team showcased their approach being one aiming for the reverence found in Saving Private Ryan, Dye would ultimately become a major advocate and force on the project. As Hirschman recounted, Dai had wide-ranging influence, particularly with the weapons and even the goals of each mission. He looked at some missions and said they were bullshit, said Hirschman in 1999. The team then proceeded with Dai's help to construct missions, some of which actually happened, end quote. This influence can be seen even in the opening intro of the game, as Dai's voice literally frames the narrative and conflict of the Second World War for gamers. Adolf Hitler's Nazi party fanned the flames of a broken and dispirited nation rebuilding the country from the ashes of the Versailles Treaty into a fascist juggernaut seemed unstoppable. They pushed all the way to the Atlantic in their blitzkrieg with England their next target. But Winston Churchill and his small island nation won the Battle of Britain, holding out through Hitler's terror bombing for an entire year. They stoked the fires of freedom long enough to stay alive and to save the world. The quote-unquote small island nation of Britain had already saved the world, now you're going to do the same once more. There is an assumption that's been made by these developers, and those that have worked on Project with Die, 
that his approach combines military authenticity with his own conception of what it means to be a soldier as a neutral historical fact. To better understand why thoughtlessly reiterating Dai's point of view is problematic and not reflective of history, we must examine him to understand what kind of point of view his supervision provided the films he worked on, and especially Medal of Honor. Looking at his military career, it is extensive and my intention is not to discount the service he performed, even if I had particular qualms with the conflicts he served in. All this being said though, the supervision he brings to the companies he worked with is as much a reflection of his time in the service as it is his own political ideals and goals that he has openly shared before and since he's worked in the industry. After retiring from the Marines, Dai would work as a correspondent and at times an executive editor of the magazine Soldiers of Fortune, a publication that in the mid-80s pertained to the then-growing military forces that worked as independent contractors or otherwise mercenaries. Dale wrote candidly and continually about how he saw that era in America. As he wrote in his column as executive editor, We are faced with a world situation today that fairly screams for American involvement. American action and commitment to fights for freedom like the one which failed in Vietnam. One of these fights freedom he supported most specifically was the Salvadorian government's fight against the Ferbando Martin Nacional Liberation Front, or FMLN, in the then raging civil war. He derided the American government's pitiful assistance to the government forces. Despite the president's personal commitment, we can't manage to muster any more than 55 trainers to help the Salvadorian government fight communist guerrillas. Dai himself would work as a military advisor in a 12-day training mission in El Salvador for government forces, which he would document within the SOF November 1984 issue. Reflecting on this conflict, as well as others in reference to America's experience in Vietnam, he wrote, Those continuing struggles to preserve the freedom and dignity of oppressed people are the real lessons we should have learned from Vietnam. Dai here is making a consequential claim about the conflicts he described. These are oppressed people simply fighting back, preserving freedom. These blanket statements do not reflect reality and instead apply shoddy moral framing to deeply complicated and fraught wars and conflicts. Vietnam becomes simply a fight for freedom, and not a conflict born originally from a history of French colonialism, which was then picked up by the US within the scope of its own political and ideological war against the Soviet Union and not for the betterment of those living in Vietnam. Looking especially at El Salvador, when Dai had traveled to, to train government forces there, that conflict was anything but a neutral endeavor. The conflict, which had been ongoing since 1979, had seen the government forces continually carry out massive human rights abuses and the killings of thousands of its civilians. In 1981, for instance, the El Mazato massacre, which had been internationally reported on, mind you, at the time of its occurrence, would see 1,200 men, women, children killed during the operation. Old men were tortured, then executed. Mothers were separated from their children, raped, executed, crying. Frying children were forced into the convent. Soldiers fired through windows. More than 100 children died. Their average age was six. In 1984, when Dai traveled to advise El Salvadorian forces, the UN sanctioned commission on the events of the Salvadorian Civil War would describe in retrospect that during the first eight months of 1984, the number of civilian deaths attributed to the army, security forces, and death squads came to 1,965. In summary, when investigated by the same commission, they attributed as much as 85% of the acts of violence to state agents, with approximately 5% of the acts of violence being attributed to the FMLN. This conflict does not afford itself the good war claim that Dai had placed upon him. This is not to indict him as some sort of war criminal. His advisor role does not necessarily connect him to any specific acts of violence. And even in the situation where that same group of fighters had been involved in acts of civilian violence, that does not mean that Dai would have agreed to that violence. Though notably, Dai did not accidentally end up there, or accidentally write those words that advocated for their cause. Reporting was widespread about the human rights abuses, and even US officials had openly come out against the death squads that had been committing violence, with permission and direction by the Salvadorian government. Importantly, that conflict, which lasted 12 years, is not an easy history to parse. And one can be forgiven for not having all of the information, but Dai importantly chose to ignore certain realities. In his detailed write-up of his time as a military advisor to the Salvadorian armed forces, not once does he mention the vast number of civilian killings, even while directly commenting on the necessity for troops to get better training. Dai then in choosing to portray the conflict as simply that of protecting freedom, was making a conscious choice to portray the conflict in a specific way, importantly a political way. And in thinking about Howard Zinn's argument, he's using the rhetoric found in films like Saving Private Ryan even before they existed, and what he would go on to help, Medal of Honor, 
that perpetuate this idealized idea of the good war. It just so happens that for Dai, throughout his life he has continually supported almost all conflicts done by the US military as good wars. To put it another way, he's a hawk. He believes the American role in the world should be militarily defined and is just in pursuing that goal, despite all evidence to the contrary. That ideology, consequentially, is what he brought to the projects he worked on. Before Dai's first film advisory role on the 1986 film Platoon, he provided a clear identification of what he felt was important for a film about the military within the pages of SOF. In an article covering the film First Blood Part II for SOF in 1985, Dai gushed about the film, praising its authenticity. It's in these opening scenes that you begin to get a feel for the technical accuracy Stallone has demanded from his production crew. An interesting claim to make about Rambo, to be sure. Elsewhere, he writes, When this film is released across the country on the 22nd of May, Stallone's major migraine may be finding tax shelters across the country for all the money American veterans plunk down at ticket counters to sit for a couple hours and see themselves portrayed in a shining light. It's about time someone in one of America's most influential industries spent the money and effort to get the technical details right. It's notable that Dai here acknowledges film as consequentially influential, even before his own entrance into the film industry. Also that there is a connection between veterans seeing themselves being portrayed in a positive light and the technical details being correct. This for Dai will make up how he will approach his role in shaping films. Throughout the article, despite praising the attention to detail of the film, he does spend ample time detailing numerous minute inaccuracies, almost obsessively so, though his outlook on the film still stands. For Dai, the technical details could be let go if they imparted the right message. The character who cares so much for Rambo and the honor of his service would be better portrayed in current camouflage BDUs, but it doesn't hurt the effect. Corinna is believable and quite capable of bringing a long, loud cheer of veterans when he takes on the CIA field agent and reveals that the politicians never really did give a damn if we won or lost in Vietnam. Dai here then effectively makes judgments about the film's accuracy not on the historical particulars, but a greater concept of what a conflict was really about. Stating this plainly in an interview with the New York Times in 2005, other people think all I have to do is teach you how to hold a weapon or wear your uniform, Dai says rubbing out a cigarette. Not in my book, not at all, because the performance comes from the heart and the heart has to have a certain amount of understanding. And as has been seen, what Dai identifies as the understanding of any conflict is not a deep analysis of the history he is not, as his website states, a military historian. He instead, as has been shown in regard to Vietnam and El Salvador, he understands conflicts politically and ideologically. But importantly, and this is the point of all of this analysis of Dai, is that the films he's helped work on, his contribution is portrayed as objective, historical, authentic. The lead of Saving Private Ryan, Tom Hanks, described this idea. Without Dai, we would have had zero authenticity in regard to our roles. His work permeated every scene. The whole reason for focusing so heavily on Dai as a central figure is not to put all of this entirely at the feet of him, but to acknowledge that this viewpoint is understood as non-political and neutral when anyone looking at the work and the point of view of Dai with even the, the tiniest bit of suspicion would acknowledge that he is anything but neutral. Returning to Medal of Honor, it's notable that the design team and publisher would on more than a few occasions struggle with the notion that it would never come out. As Hirschman described it to Edge magazine, the game was for a moment on death's door. Paul Butcher, the president of the Congressional Medal of Honor Society, himself a recipient, would make his case against the game in Hirschman's words, when it comes to the Medal of Honor, it's a serious and sacred thing. You don't turn it into a video game. It's an awful thing to do. He made a really compelling case that we shouldn't be doing this. The team was crestfallen. Spielberg was ready to pull the plug on a project that he'd effectively been working on since even before the end of his own World War II epic. Though despite the initial derision and complaints against the game carrying the Medal of Honor title, Butcher Like Die would change his mind after seeing the game in action. Butcher and his organization would actually ultimately go on to endorse the game. This is strange, for many reasons. This was an era in which games had little cultural acceptance. This was also the moment of Columbine, which would happen mere months before the release of the game. I mean, remember, the media would go into a frenzy about how the killers had spent time playing games like Doom, had played a demonstrable role in their murderous rage. ...game that is front and center. Unlike violent TV or movies, such games let players participate in the violence, not just watch. And that's what sets these games apart. In that way, you are the fighter pilot. You are 
you know, the uh, aggressor. You are pulling the trigger and shooting, which you don't do in a, in a movie medium. Studies have already shown the impact some commercials and movies can have on children. And now, some say the stakes are raised when a troubled child can play the role of a killer an hour after hour of violent computer games. For some reason, Medal of Honor never received that controversy after being released, so soon after the school shooting. Not that it should have, of course, and obviously Doom was not the reason that the shooting took place as well, but I would argue that Medal of Honor, for the media and for someone like Paul Butcha and Dai, it weaved a narrative that they agreed with. Even though the enemies of Medal of Honor were more lifelike, and ultimately were representations of real humans, not fictitious ones, they were representations of something that was assumed to be truthful. It was okay that they were killing in this way, because World War II had at that time been canonized in a specific way. Remember this greatest generation framework, and as such was deemed somehow different from the far simpler experience of Doom. Only a few years after the release and cultural dominance that Medal of Honor received, 2002's E3 would bring a new development. The show would reveal Wind Waker, Xbox Live, and in the West Hall, America's Army. America's Army was a PC first-person shooter that was funded entirely by the US military. The game would, like Medal of Honor, take the industry by storm. It would use this cultural moment that saw the canonizing of the good war ethos mixed with America's new nationalistic streak after the tragedy of 9-11 and America's own entrance into a war in Afghanistan. As Scott Osborne of GameSpot couldn't help but identify the irony of the game's existence, more than a few American politicians have bolstered their careers by condemning violence in popular entertainment, particularly in video games. Now the US government, by the way of the army, has produced a computer game that's all about realistic, deadly combat. The game was of course not simply released as a Counter-Strike clone for the fun of it. The focus was on recruitment, as P.W. Singer, one year after America's Army was released, one-fifth of West Point's freshman class said they had played the game. By 2008, a study by two researchers at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology found that 30% of all Americans aged 16 to 24 had a more positive impression of the Army because of the game, and even more amazingly, the game had more impact on recruits than all other forms of Army advertising combined. The game's media at the time was notably in its infancy, and much of the coverage on most games was descriptive, sort of like reviews of electronics. Like, wow, the, the graphics are an 8, the sound a 10! Everything was understood as a product. And in terms of reviewing the then new product from the US military, they did so in glowing terms. The first time I hit 36 out of 40 pop-up targets to earn my expert badge was the highlight of my own basic training. And it was a hoot reliving it on the computer. America's army is built around authentic army combat techniques. There's no better way to see how the army does it other than doing it for real. Again, the same language is used to understand this type of betrayal, authentic the closest thing to the real thing, and as such it becomes neutral, normalized. It's completely normal for a military force to freely distribute lifelike simulations of killing in its name to and specifically targeted at a younger generation for the purpose of joining the war in Afghanistan and then later in Iraq. They are all framed in like terms to the good old war of the allies fighting the Nazis. Somehow, playing Doom makes you a killer, but playing America's army makes you a patriot. This is just the tip of the iceberg of a much deeper conversation, as I've realized in the seemingly endless pit of research I have sifted through, and as such deserves more time for analyzing this very complicated relationship that video games, the US military, and American culture has with what it means to represent certain realities of violence, and the way in which some narratives, like those of Dale A. Die, are deemed authentic, and others are deemed problematic. And importantly, this conversation is still happening, as I will describe in the next video about how video games like the soon to be released Six Days in Fallujah were deemed improper 10 years ago, but are now seen as generally okay and commercially viable. In conclusion here, this was a labor of love in a sense, because I wanted to get this right. It's a hard subject to cover, because I really didn't want to invalidate the need for sympathy of those that have served. But in pulling apart these pieces of art that showcase this empathy, they aren't solely empathetic and to me calls much for people to give their lives to conflicts that do not protect the people or ideals of America, but rather will only leave veterans with that same trauma experience by the greatest generation without any end in sight. 
I really appreciate you watching this, and if you got something out of this video essay, I'd like you to consider supporting me on Patreon, so that I can continue making content. I'd also like to really thank my Patreon supporter, uh, Daniel Witt's first contribution. 